Hey guys, and welcome to another review video. This time around, let's do something a little bit different because I've covered the first three volumes of the Looney Tunes Collector's Choice and I figured let's change things up a bit because I am doing the Looney Tunes Review Project and it's nothing but Looney Tunes, so every so often I do want to try and maybe mix things up. So I hope you guys will enjoy this one because some of you have asked whether I actually like Hannah Barbera, and uh, you'll get your answer here as well. So, this one is for Hey There, It's Yogi Bear, and that was released in a brand new restoration via Warner Archive, and it was released a while back, but that was before I was doing reviews, so I'm going to look at maybe catching up and doing all of the Warner Archive releases as they come out. Now, it actually was released on DVD, a while back, I think at least 10 or so years ago, and now we're, now we've got the movie in HD for the first time, and up until this point, Archive had already released a few Blu-rays, so they released the Jetsons, Johnny Quest, both of which I highly recommend, and I will look at doing reviews for those as well, and the greatest one of all, which is Josie and the Pussycats in Outer Space, and that's the greatest show ever made, and I I said it, okay? I said it. No, I'm kidding, of course. So a bit of personal history with this movie, I remember seeing this on VHS, it was actually taped, where the first part of the tape had the man called Flintstone, and that was my first exposure to the Flintstones before the live action movie, which came out not long after. And after that, it was Hey There, It's Yogi Bear, so I had the two taped, and little did I know, they both were the first forays into feature filmmaking that Hannah Barbera did, and then they just stuck with TV projects for a while, and then they got back into it with Charlotte's Web in the 70s. You know, these days, it's kind of interesting, because when I was growing up, Hanna-Barbera was well in the pop culture, and, you know, similar to how Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck is, and so on, and yet it feels like the current generation barely even know who the Hanna-Barbera characters are, like Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, Quick Jordan McGraw. So you got Disney, they kept Mickey and the other characters in the spotlight for many years, including projects like the latest Mickey Mouse cartoons that came out, which I personally enjoyed, I know some don't, but hey, people still know who Mickey Mouse is, right? Then Warners, now they're far from perfect. I definitely had issues with them sort of dropping the characters in the 2000s, meaning you have literally a whole generation who don't know who they are. They still did stuff eventually, including the latest Looney Tunes cartoons. Some are critical of those ones, but hey, once again, we at least know who these characters are. And now we've got a generation who can watch those, then go back to the original stuff. But Hanna-Barbera, it was everywhere in the 90s. When we eventually got Cartoon Network here in Australia, which was like in the mid-90s, they were playing on TV all the time and was mostly in the mornings and after school. So you would have... Things like Dexter's Laboratory, you'd have Powerpuff Girls and all those shows, but then they would be mixed up with other shows like the Flintstones, Jetsons, and even the mid-70s stuff like R Richie Rich and, you know, Scooby-Doo and that sort of stuff. There were even two Flintstones live-action movies, one in 1994, which I maintain is underrated, not perfect, but I think it did capture the spirit of the original first two seasons pretty decently. The less said about the prequel, the better, but they still came out and people knew who the Flintstones were, right? But then they just sort of disappeared. And yes, I know of one exception. I will get to that. But they mostly disappeared and they, the older shows, they just stopped showing them. For stuff like Richie Rich or whatever, it's not really a major loss, I would argue. But then the good stuff, like Flintstones, Top Cat, Johnny Quest, it was like no one cared about it anymore. They just went away. Yeah, they released the DVDs in the early 2000s, and thank goodness they did for some of it, because they couldn't do it now because of music rights and such, but there was not much by way of anything new. The only thing I recall was that they did some WWE promotion thing in the 2000s or 2010s, and it had like Flintstones with WWE characters and Jetsons as well, and you'd have to wonder, who exactly was that for? You know, can anyone explain that to me? I don't know how that came about, but anyway. I know you guys are now yelling through your screen saying, what about Scooby-Doo? Yes, that's the big exception. You know, whether you like him or not, at the end of the day, they just kept going with the character. He's proved popular. I'm hit or miss when it comes to Scooby-Doo. I like some of it, not so much the other stuff, but they kept going with it. And sure enough, Scooby-Doo is still very much well known today, whether it's from the live action movies or from the recent TV shows, or Velma. I mean, 
it, it's not good. I gave it a go, but hey, at least we still know who Scooby Doo is, right? Because of shows like that coming out. But since the early '90s, we've had no new Flintstone shows. We've had no new Jetsons. There's been no Yogi Bear other characters until fairly recently. I know that Jellystone came out. Now I haven't seen it, and that art style doesn't exactly appeal to me no i'm not gonna be one of those old man yelling at cloud things saying oh the art is crap and no it's just not for me it just doesn't appeal to me maybe i'll check it out one day but this is clearly for a different audience and you know what if you like it good on you but before jellystone when it came to yogi we had the brilliant yo yogi series where they tried to make everything hip and it kind of reminds me of the whole poochie thing and roy in that simpsons episode you know with making everyone you know really hip with the sunglasses and all that sort of stuff now one archive if you're listening make that your next blu-ray release okay we need the complete yo yogi series all right so that will sell like hot cakes believe me you know and now i'm assuming you're gonna Send an offer of employment to give you such to give you even more great ideas such as that. So, unlike the Looney Tunes Collector's Choice release, we have a release that will most likely appeal more to those who grew up with Hanna Barbera, such as myself. This will be less of a blind buy, whereas the Looney Tunes stuff, it's Looney Tunes. So people will, will pick it up because they like Bugs Bunny, they like Daffy Duck, Falkhorn, whatever. So the question I do get asked by some people here and there who once they find out who I actually am and they send me a friend request or whatever on Facebook, you know, what are my thoughts on Hanna-Barbera in general? In short, I do love Hanna-Barbera, though there is a little bit of an asterisk there. For me, when I say Hanna-Barbera, I mean mostly the stuff that was released in the late 50s to the mid 60s. Now that's not to say that there was nothing decent at all after that, but once the studio perfected how to make the cartoons quickly and cheaply for TV, and then once they were bought out by the Taft Corporation in 66, along with stricter rules coming in for what was deemed as quote-unquote children's entertainment, since that's what animation was seen in the US at that time, whatever charm there was in the beginning just about vanished. And there were some good things, like even if you're not a fan of Scooby-Doo, the first series I actually think is not that bad, the first two seasons at least. They hadn't figured out the formula, so you can see them trying things, and it's, for what it is, it's pretty entertaining, but later on, once they get the formula down, it gets kind of dull, and they introduce Scooby Dumb, and yeah, it's... Yeah, if you guys want me to review every single Scooby-Doo episode, don't bother asking, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Maybe I should, I don't know, we'll see. But in the period when the studio was first figuring out how to get animation done on really low budgets compared to theatricals. That was very evident in their first production, which was Rough and Ready. And then up until about the second or so season of the Flintstones, they're very entertaining and it's great to see how they were just trying to figure things out. What could they could do to have their shortcuts so that way they can stretch their dollar, but at the same time still maintain some level of quality. And I think part of that as well is that it was mostly staffers that came from theatricals that lost their jobs because a lot of the studios were closing down at the time. You had Disney in the early 50s, you had Warner Brothers that were starting to now close down or and tightening their budgets a fair bit. So there was definitely a change in the air and television animation was definitely the way to go. And because these were the masters of their craft, they were able to adapt fairly quickly. And not only that, you even had great writers because a lot of that is what Chuck Jones famously said was illustrated radio, but they had two of their best Looney Tunes writers, Warren Foster and Mike Maltese. And you've even had the people in charge, Hannah and Joseph Barbera, they directed the Tom and Jerry shorts. They timed it. They wrote it. They did all, all sorts of stuff there. So they definitely knew the craft. It wasn't just some quote unquote man in a suit in charge of things. They knew what they were doing. So it's definitely a period of animation that I definitely have a, a great fascination with. Because if it wasn't for Hanna Barbera, whether you like this stuff or not, you wouldn't have TV animation as it is today. So they definitely have to be credited for a lot of that. And again, whether you like this stuff or not, that's irrelevant they should be at least praised for pioneering stuff or helping to pioneer certain things yes upa really took off with the limited animation part but Hanna Barbera perfected it for television animation at least that's my view on it so for those of you who aren't that familiar with yogi because again you might be part of that generation that you were completely looked over when it came to yogi you would probably at least know the premise in some way it's just basically a bear in a park in this case it's jellystone park and yellowstone park and he always seems to have an appetite he likes to steal picnic baskets much to the annoyance of ranger smith who tries to stop him 
Oh, and sometimes he'll have a sidekick, Ubu, who is sometimes along for the ride. So, nothing deep here. But for a character that's meant for a, for six or so minute shorts, it's fine. In fact, the Oigi shorts are quite fun. You may already know the premise going in when you're watching it, but it's how the premise is executed that is fun to see. So Yogi was first introduced in the Huckleberry Hound show, or sorry, the Huckleberry Hound show. I'm sorry, that's terrible, but I had to give it a go. And that had three short segments. So you had Huckleberry Hound, of course, Pixie and Dixie with Mr. Jinx, and Yogi Bear. Now, Yogi eventually proved to be so popular that he was spun off into his own show, and that show followed that Huckleberry Hound model. So it had three shorts per show. So you had Yogi, it had Snagglepuss, and everyone's favorite character, the best Hanna Barbera character of all time, Yaki Doodle. Okay? Oh, what do you know? It's my favorite duck, Yaki Doodle. Happy birthday, Yogi! Don't at me. I think that's what the kids say now. Hmm. But <laughs> the greatest Hanna Barbera character is Yaki Doodle. All right? Don't at me. Okay? <laughs> Even after the show's cancellation, the character proved to be so popular. That when it came time that Hanna Barbera were going to work on their first feature film, doing one on Yogi, it's a no-brainer, really. The character was very popular, and that would be an easy sell to a distributor as opposed to creating something new and untested, completely from scratch. Not to mention, this film was going to have a higher budget than the show would have had, so you would want a return on the investment. So, doing a spin-off movie on a popular character, yeah, that's that makes complete sense. Why not? So that's why they would have picked Yogi. So the end result was, Hey There, It's Yogi Bear, released in 1964. Now, I actually hadn't seen this since I was a kid. It's on that VHS tape. And I actually did miss getting the original DVD. Thankfully, it doesn't matter anymore because now we get this giant leap in quality straight to Blu-ray. And from what I remember watching this as a kid, the difference in quality is just mind-boggling. So I've gone from... A VHS tape from TV thing to something that was remastered in 4K and downscaled to HD. The difference is amazing. And even if you watch this and don't like it, you still can't argue with the quality here. You can't argue that this looks amazing. Absolutely amazing. You're not going to confuse this production with what Disney were doing at the time. Yes, even 101 Dalmatians and Sword in the Stone because there were definitely some cuts in the budget for those films. But... You can see that they did put some extra effort into this one compared to what they were doing in the show. And the background, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm admiring what they did here, whether it's a realistic background that you see in the beginning when we see the coming of spring and uh, the circus scenes, that sort of stuff. But they've also got some stylized scenes with those musical numbers where the background, yeah, just absolutely pops. Animation-wise, now here is where it's quite interesting. So it's still limited animation, right? But it's definitely a little bit more fuller than the show. So it's kind of like halfway between limited and full. So I guess you'll see some scenes where it comes across as more full. But then you've got other scenes where it's pretty much like in the TV show. With just one part being animated versus the whole thing. If you haven't seen the original show. The sole bonus feature is an episode from that show. So you're able to actually compare the difference for yourself. That episode may not be as raw as maybe the first few Yogi shorts that came out during the Huckleberry Hound show, but you at least can get a rough idea here of the difference. And this movie, if you look at the credits, it actually features quite a few ex-theatrical animation folks that you may know of. So you got animator Ken Harris, who did a lot of amazing work in the Chuck Jones unit. Jerry Chinicky, who was a mainstay with the Fris Freelings unit. Irv Spence, he worked with Tex Avery at Warner's before going to MGM and working on Tom and Jerry, etc, etc. And I can just go on about each of those animators. But, but while, again, it's still limited animation, some sequences look like they were animated on ones. It looks like they really went above and beyond. So maybe some of the animators just wanted to add that extra flourish just because, even though they didn't really need to. It was probably going above and beyond what was actually expected from them. As a funny little side note, it actually makes some of the character designs pointless because the reason these characters in Hanna Barbera would wear bow ties and that sort of thing is so that when they were animating on for TV, you'd have the body where they didn't have to animate, right? And if they just wanted to have the head talking, they could just animate the head. But instead of figuring out connect the head 
to the body, they could just tilt the drawing itself. They just tilt the head, and the and the actual tie would hide the connection between the head and the body, which makes sense. But here, you don't really need it because most because a lot of it's animated more fuller than the actual TV show. But whatever, it's part of the charm, and now it's just seen as part of the design. But that design actually did have a function in the original television shorts. Uh, one bit of interesting trivia. So Mark Evania's blog, News For Me, which I highly suggest you check out if you have the chance to do so. Apparently Fritz Feeling was going to direct the film, but it was kept secret because at the time he was still animated at Warner's, but their studio was going to be shut down. So he was looking for other employment, as one would, right? And he started storyboarding the film, but then he ended up teaming up with David DePatty and formed DePatty Freeling, and the film was then just taken over by Hanna Barbera and Warren Foster help, helped write it as well. And so DePatty Freeling would end up doing the Pink Panther shorts along with other shorts that famous, such as the Daffy Speedy shorts, you know, everyone's favorite, of course. But anyway, the rest is history. But yeah, it looked like Fritz Freeling was going to was slated to direct it. Now that would have been interesting because the timing would have been absolutely something. In fact, there's even one scene in here which comes across like Fritz Freeling directed in terms of timing and I'll get to that soon. But he's not credited on here, but yes, he apparently he actually did start off. Now I do have a confession to make. So in re-watching this film for the first time since I was young, this is definitely a case of liking the parts more than the whole. And that's kind of an issue I'm finding with some of the things I'm revisiting from when I was a kid. And one great example was Power Rangers. And I was the perfect age. I was, you know, seven, eight, nine years old when Power Rangers was absolutely huge. And I absolutely loved it. I loved the story. And I loved coming home from school and watching the next episode. And it was just mind-blowing just how the story would go along. Not to mention all the fights, the Zords, and of course the toys that came with all of that stuff. And I even got to meet two of the Power Rangers. One has since unfortunately passed on, but it was still a thrill to meet them. But I checked out those episodes. I just wanted to see how it would look like now with adult eyes. And I would say, if you love Power Rangers as a kid, probably don't revisit it because... It may spoil your memory. It's not good. <laughs> it's not good. The only bits I did like were the Japanese stuff, which came from Super Sentai, because they basically took that show. But anyway, so when I watched this film, that kind of felt like what had happened to me, where this film felt a lot better when I watched it in my youth versus now, when I can recognize you know, story problems and that sort of stuff. But don't worry, this is not going to be some negative field review. I don't like to be overly negative on things, but it was definitely something that came to mind when I finished the film. And I watched it with my kids too, because I thought I'd see how they would feel about it. Because the only Yogi they knew was there was like one 4D ride that we went on that actually had a special thing from the Yogi Bear movie that came out in 2011. Remember that was a thing, right? This was 89 minutes and it felt way longer than that and it, this definitely had pacing problems and I've seen films that are three or so hours long that breeze by and then you got shorter films like this that take forever due to pacing problems my one of my top five films of all time is Once Upon a Time in America and I recently watched the longer cut which is like four hours and 20 minutes and yet it doesn't feel like four hours and 20 minutes that's how good the pacing is for me but anyway I think the issue, by well, one of them at least, is that the credited writers here, they hadn't done a feature length film. You had Warren Foster, who is another ex Warner Brothers animation staff, and by this point he had done a lot of Hannah Barbera shorts, like from the Yogi Bear show, he, he helped develop the Flintstones and that sort of stuff. And you've also got Hannah Barbera, they're credited as writers too and, direct, and, and as directors, but they also hadn't done a feature either. So I think that's part of the problem. They were sort of thinking along the lines of, shorts and the TV shows that they were doing at the time, but not in terms of a whole feature. And I'll go through that in a moment. I also don't really see Yogi as being a great candidate for a feature. He's not a very deep character, so he works better in six or so minute shorts and in certain cases like that Yogi Bear birthday thing that's a special feature on there. 
I know that they tried again in the 80s with a few of the Superstar 10 movies that had Yogi in it, and I haven't seen them, so I'll be curious to see how they fare story-wise. But, again, he's fine for a few antics in maybe a short, but, yeah, it, the antics get old real fast, especially as the film goes along and we get into the third act. It really does. But, anyway, I'm not going to go too in-depth covering each and every aspect of the movie like I do with the Looney Tunes reviews. One day, maybe I will, but for now, I just want to stick to the basics. So, here there's an overarching story that really doesn't begin in earnest until roughly the end of Act 1, and it feels like a whole bunch of mini-adventures strung together, complete with musical numbers to pad things along further, which I will certainly touch upon. But here's how it goes. So, you start off with Spring, your booby wakes up, Yogi's all excited, Cindy is around too, she's extra excited, it is Spring, hint, hint, Yogi is completely oblivious and after and is after picnic baskets once again. The ranger has reopened Jellystone Park for the new season, but sees Yogi's up to no good once again. You get all your usual shenanigans that you would see in the Yogi Bear show, but eventually Ranger Smith has had enough and Yogi is to move to the San Diego Zoo. So that idea is actually pretty good. I gotta say, the idea that Yogi's gonna be kicked out once and for all, right? Because the rangers had absolutely had enough. Now, since Yogi is smarter than the average bear, he manages to get a, well, southern-sounding bear to go in his place, and Yogi then sticks around in secret as the brown phantom, and again, stealing more picnic baskets. Ranger Smith is extra confused, but it happens. Cindy's heartbroken. She decides to pretend to be the brown phantom in order to get caught, and her theory is, I want to get caught. I'll be sent to the San Diego Zoo to be with Yogi, but she ends up being sent to St. Louis. Yogi eventually finds out, and since Ranger Smith won't help, he goes with Boo Boo to get Cindy back, who, after falling off a train, is encountered by two circus owners who want her to do a high-wire act to get customers coming back to their own show. Kind of convoluted, isn't it? Like, when I'm reading this out, I'm going, wow, a lot actually does happen, but anyway. So, I would say the first act is the best, even though the picnic-stealing stuff does get a little old quick. But it sets things up nicely, and things are actually a little bit different in what would actually happen in the Yogi Bear show, where things would get wrapped up pretty quickly. But here, it's like something different. Hey, I've had enough. You're going to San Diego. So, okay, fine. So, Act 2. So, that is all about the rescue of Cindy, which makes sense. So, you have Yogi and Boo Boo in a very long scene in different modes of travel. And that actually has some great timing. I actually like that scene. And they manage to end up in the exact same town where there is a parade. And they notice Cindy is the main attraction at this circus. Convenient, yeah, but whatever. You just go with it. There's nothing really wrong with that. So the rest of the act is basically them rescuing her from the circus. And with Yogi being caught at one point And they end up getting away. And for what it is, act two is fine. It, there's a song in it. Could have been trimmed a little, but... It's fine. Maybe some of the bits do go on a little bit too long, but for the most part, it's fine. But once that happens, you notice that there is still half an hour to go. If this was another film, you, you might have maybe had the two circus owners on the chase or something, and then maybe getting rested at the end or whatever, but no. As soon as they're done at the circus, they're out of there. Done. The trio, it's about them getting back to the park. The circus owners, we don't see or hear from them ever again. And here is the problem. You've now got this big stretch of different sequences, both musical and bits that maybe work okay in a short, but it feels like they just ran out of steam, that they ran out of ideas and they just needed to add something just to pad the runtime out. Things do pick up a little bit when they actually get to New York, but you could have pretty much cut out the entire part from them escaping from the circus and ending up in New York, maybe a couple of lines of dialogue, or maybe you have them escape in the back of a truck and they wake up in New York or something. And you'd lose practically nothing. Like, really? If you cut all of that out. But yeah, as you'd expect, the ranger ends up rescuing the trio. Somehow having a magical helicopter that somehow got him all the way from Jellystone all the way to New York and back. And yes, I hope somebody got fired for that blunder. But whatever. And we end up with everything back to normal. So... With the third act, definitely the weakest. They definitely needed to redo that. But it is what it is. 
Now, so let's now talk about the music. So the actual score itself, I'm actually a sucker for a lot of the mid 60s sound in terms of scoring, like in this one and in the Jungle Book. It's a product of its time and I don't know, I just enjoy it. And I do like the soundtrack in this one, but then you have the songs and that is usually cited as the worst thing in this. I kind of agree because some of the song sequences add to the story issues, but it's not all bad. Independently, they're actually nice songs to listen to. The problem is most of them could be stand to be trimmed, such as the song in the beginning that Cindy sings. Let's do what lovers do. Pursue what they pursue. If they can love, so can we. You can actually pretty much remove all the songs from this and it would change nothing. I've actually seen talks by people who write musicals and they basically said, if you can cut out your songs from your musical and if it doesn't change anything, then you haven't done your job properly. So here's your problem right here. The worst song by far is Veni Veno Vene, which Yogi sings like James Darren for some reason, who was a singer at the time. He was contracted to Columbia. They probably used him because he was probably just cheap because he was under contract anyway. And since Columbia were di going to distribute it in the end anyway. And they're imagining they're in Venice and the song is fine. Like it's actually a very nice song, but it's so out of place and that should have all been removed. There was no reason for it to be in there whatsoever. But anyway. I always dream of Veni, Veno, Veni. Gosh, you sing just like James Darren. Ah, uh, that's not easy. However, there is one big exception. And you're all probably going to kill me for giving you an earworm. But there's a song sung by Jonah and the Wailers called St. Louis. Okay, and that is easily the best thing in the movie, like out of everything, this one bit, the energy from the song and the timing of the movements of the bears and the suitcases, it's so good. It actually makes you forget that the song could have easily been cut out as well with no real pairing on the story. Oh, boy. Again, the only thing I hate about that song is that it's such a damn earworm. In fact, it was one of the bits I remembered from watching as a kid. I was trying to remember before I watched it, what do I remember from the movie? And that was one of them. That's how good it is. It's on the river and it's so exquisite. I know we're going there. Well, just where is it? I don't know. I don't know. And if you are wondering, why do they bother with songs in the first place? But you have to remember, back then, the king of animation features was Disney and each movie was a musical, though... With 101 Dalmatians, it was a little bit of a more level, but they still had songs. So it comes across as a normal thing for, for an animated feature to do, right? I'd say it's more of a financial reason, because home video wasn't a thing back then, so they couldn't recoup money from selling videotapes or whatever. It just wasn't a thing back then. But they could sell records of the soundtrack. By doing that, they can recoup some of the costs back, so... Doing it as a musical, selling records, it's a no-brainer. It's just a shame that they couldn't make the actual music work more into the context of the film. So, is this worth watching? I would actually say yes. The positives do outweigh the negatives. The animation is great for what it is. The backgrounds pop in every moment that you see. The voice actors are at the top of their game and even hear Mel Blanc in a few scenes. Always a treat to hear, even though it's post his accident, of course. You got Doors Butler, um, Don Messick. You've got everyone on top of their game here. 
some bits are actually really funny, like this dog that's like a precursor to Muttley and, and his um, relationship with the two circus owners. That's pretty funny. And a few of the animation bits are funny too, like the way he steals the, some picnic baskets. But again, the songs, they do affect the flow of the film, but independently they're fine. And hey, you can even fast forward them if you don't like them, which is actually pretty good. You know, you're not gonna really miss much anyway. So the big negative is the story. And I actually think the crew would have benefited from having story men who perhaps worked on Disney features to maybe smooth that out, especially in the third act. That really needed to be redone. In fact, it really should have been just those circus guys chasing after the trio in some funny set pieces. Maybe they're hiding out. The circus guys are like, oh, where are they in this small town? And you got this funny set piece. They might move to another bit than another and then end up in New York. Something like that. Then they get arrested for something that was maybe alluded to earlier. And the finale could be the dog just chomping on one of the owners for the final time and just laughing because they got arrested or something. I don't know. But the third act definitely needed to be redone. But anyway, whatever. It's all done. Can't really change the past, can we? But let's talk about what you actually get in this Warner Archive release. So you get the movie, and as I mentioned, it was remastered in 4K. It's downscaled to HD for Blu-ray. Yeah, I always prefer 4K discs where possible, but here it's perfectly fine. I don't think there would have been too much difference in quality. It is top-notch work by the One Archive team. And they even put back the original Columbia Pictures logo in the beginning because they distributed the film at the time, even though the film is now owned by Warners. The sound is in stereo. It's very solid. And you'll notice that this audio of the song sound like it was recorded in high quality. But all in all, for a movie of this vintage, no complaints about the sound whatsoever. Extras, there is only one, and it would have been nice if there was some sort of a small feature on the movie itself, maybe giving a brief history, but again, budgets and all that stuff, I get it. But we do get one that's actually a little bit of a tease, and that is an episode of the Yogi Bear Show, but it's a special one. So it's to do with Yogi's birthday. And instead of having three shorts in that episode, like they normally would, it's one full episode with Yogi and the other Hanna Barbera characters celebrating Yogi's birthday. I know that a lot of Yogi shorts have been remastered. They were put on streaming. I actually have them and seen them and they look pretty good, but we do need them all on disc. And let's get this out of the way right now. At the time of this recording, there are no plans to do the other shows like Quick Jaw McGraw due to issues with the elements and music rights. I certainly hope that they get released. I'm not saying I don't want them to, but I'm also being realistic as well because I think the hairs to some of the music rights owners are just asking for too much money and they're just in the way. So it is what it is, but hopefully something can be fixed. So all in all, is this worth buying? I mean, I guess it depends. If you like it, it's a no-brainer. If, so if, you, if you're familiar with the film and you liked it, buy it. If you're sort of on the fence, maybe wait for a sale. I would think. I mean, it's been out for a while, and usually I like to say, hey, buy day one and all that stuff if you can. But if you're really not sure, I would definitely say wait for a sale. And it is part of animation history. It is the first animated feature from the studio whose work in television paved the way for how television animation is today. But it just depends on how in-depth you want your animation library to be. I mean, I think it belongs in every person's animation library, but that's, of course, up to you. It's far from perfect, but there's enough here to be entertained by. So if you can get it for a good price, I definitely recommend it, despite my issues on it. But that will do it for this one. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, take care.